today in the media conference with lal goyal which is brought to you by v4 news global tv v4 stream news gaon se samvad sarokar news organ donation india foundation and gyan our endeavor is to enlighten you with the current topic and as you are well aware that recently the four states and one union treaty has gone for the elections and the results were declared only two days back that is on second and third so today's our topic is expectations from newly elected state governments but before i will come to our main topic i would like to inform that today the world is celebrating international firefighters day international firefighters day is observed on may 4th it was instituted after a proposal was emailed out across the world on january 4th 1999 due to the deaths of five 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 firefighters in tragic circumstances in a bush fire in australia one of the most significant symbols of international firefighters day is the red and blue ribbon the international firefighters day stresses those who died in the line of duty it is also to remember the others who gave their time as well and today we are also observing world asthma day World Asthma Day is an annual event organized by the Global Initiative for Asthma (GINA) to improve asthma awareness and care around the world. World Asthma Day takes place on the first Tuesday of May. WHO recognizes that asthma is of major public health importance. According to WHO, it was estimated that more than 339 million people had asthma globally and there were 4,17,918 deaths due to asthma at the global level in 2016. Although asthma cannot be cured, it is possible to manage asthma to reduce and prevent asthma attacks. The inaugural World Asthma Day was held in 1998. Media conference with Lal Goyal hopes that soon researchers will find the medicine for the cure of asthma so that many lives can be saved now coming to the main topic and that that is expectations from newly elected state government before i will go to my panelist i would just like to read the highlights of the manifestos given by the winning parties in different states first i am taking the kerala the ldf manifesto the ldf manifesto makes several welfare promises mainly focusing on employment for kerala's youth as well as rehabilitation of non residents indians nris who have returned to the state due to the pandemic the 2021 manifesto also includes some ambitious promises including 40 lakhs jobs pensions for the state's female homemakers and a rupees 10000 crore electricity project to ensure power security in the state until 2040 the ldf manifesto also promises a coastal protection and development package of rupees 5000 crore for the state's coastal regions several coastal regions in the state including velia thura and shankumagam in tiruvanthapuram have been facing coastal evasion erosion sorry the proposed scheme will look at areas where the sea has encroached the land and take measures to protect the coast said ldf manifesto the manifesto promises to increase the income from agriculture by 50% in the coming term the government will also increase welfare pensions in a phased manner the goal is to increase welfare pensions to rupees 2500 per month said ldf convener a vijay raghavan who release the manifesto the manifesto also talks about the security of senior citizens and more schemes for the protection and welfare of the state's senior citizens as part of its housing schemes for the poor the ldf says it will build 1.5 lakh houses in the coming term it also promises free houses to members of sc st community the ldf manifesto promises poverty alleviation through the promotion of small scale entrepreneurship for 45 lakh families the manifesto promises to increase loan 
amount from rupees 1 lakh to rupees 15 lakh as part of its poverty alleviation program A special consideration will also be given to auto rickshaws and taxi drivers and their problems addressed through government intervention the cpim led front also promises to introduce more public private partnership enterprises and a rupees 10000 crore investment in the next 5 years another promise is to raise the basic base price of rubber to rupees 250 per kilogram the government will also ensure that the kerala bank will start accepting nri deposits as part of its nri welfare initiatives loan waiver commissions in agriculture coastal development and education sectors will also be set up other promises include efforts to be self reliant in the production of milk eggs and vegetables the manifesto promises strong efforts to maintain the secular fabric of the state it was also promised to implement the administrative reforms commission report and publish a yearly progress report of the government's rule for public scrutiny so this was the highlights of the election manifesto of the ldf who has come in power again once again this year uh, in kerala assembly now moving to the next manifesto of the tmc who won the election with a comfortable majority uh, rather more uh, seats than the previous one in west bengal releasing the party's manifesto ms mamta banerjee promised increasing employment opportunities she said her government will work towards decreasing unemployment saying they will create 5 lakh jobs in a year it means if they are going to be there for 5 years 25 lakh jobs they are going to create they will ensure a minimum annual income of rupees 6000 and rupees 12000 for general category and backward community people respectively in bengal claiming it to be a development oriented manifesto tmc promised an income scheme for all families a student credit card and a constitution of a task force to examine the inclusion of several communities under the obc category for the first time every family in bengal will be extended a minimum basic income under this 1.6 crore general category families will get rupees 500 a month whereas sc or st category families will get rupees 1000 per month the money will be directly transferred to the women head of a family miss benerji said a new student credit card scheme will be introduced with a credit limit of rupees 10 lakhs and an interest rate of only 4% will be charged the west bengal chief minister said they also said she also said that they will set up 10 lakhs new msmes and 2000 new big industrial units in the next 5 years we shall appoint a special task force to examine and propose obc status to all the communities which are not recognized as obcs like mahashya tilli tamul and sahas they will also ask the government of india to grant st status to mahatos the tmc chief said a special development board would be set up for the development of terai and dorai doras region in north bengal she said duare sarkar program will be held four months a year free ration will be provided at door stop door step mamta benerji said so this was the key points of the uh, manifesto of tmc which is now going to take uh, charge uh, tomorrow uh, she is taking the oath so from tomorrow onwards this are the key uh, points which she has put in her manifesto so we will examine that whether what is the position and what are the expectations now i am coming to the dmk manifesto which uh, is for the tamil nadu because dmk won very comfortably in tamil nadu dmk manifesto party's election manifesto calling it the second hero party party candidates being the first hero and promising a slew of benefits like one year maternity leave and free bus passes to women to travel in city and town buses the party has promised to reserve 75% of jobs in industries for tamils 
all ration card holders would be given a one time financial assistance of rupees 4000 each the document also seeks to appease hindus by promising to earmark rupees 1000 crore to renovate and consecrate uh, temples and extend financial aid of rupees 25000 each to 1 lakh people for undertaking pilgrimage mr stalin said special courts would be set up to try ai admk ministers facing corruption charges the probe into miss jailalita's death would be speeded up he said the document has 500 promises including waiver of education loans for those under 30 and reduction in fuel prices which mr stalin has been promising in recent campaigns the party says price of diesel would be brought down by rupees 4 and petrol by rupees 5 per liter gas cylinder price would be reduced by rupees 100 he said another promise that would have far reaching impact is reduction in price of avin milk by rupees 3 per liter in a balancing act the party had has promised to allocate rupees 200 crore to maintain churches and mosques too now these points be basically about the fuel that uh, diesel be reduced by 4 rupees and petrol by 5 rupees and gas cylinder by 100 rupees and milk by 3 rupees per liter we will see after this friday because friday the dmk is taking uh, oh, mr stalin is going to take whosoever will the elected uh, representative will take the oath and uh, the chief minister whether they will implement it in the first cabinet meeting or not next is the bjp manifesto for assam mr nadda released the bjp manifesto he revealed that under mission brahmaputra the party would work to stop annual flooding in the state the party also promised to build reservoirs to store excess water from the brahmaputra and its tributaries another major promise is to empower women via orunodoy a flagship scheme of the state government that sees monthly payment of rupees 830 to deserving households this will be extended to rupees 3000 covering 30 lakh families the party said so from 830 which they are getting right now uh, now once the this government uh, the bjp government is taking charge in assam soon so they will be increasing from 830 to 3000 to 30 lakh families nam ghars nam ghars or vaishna vetti monstries will be given grant of rupees 2.5 lakh and an entrepreneurship scheme will also be launched another promise is to reconcile nrc entries under the mandate of the supreme court this will be initiated in a structured manner to protect genuine indian citizens and exclude illegal immigrants and because our topic is expectations from newly elected state governments so we are only taking this four state governments because the puducherry comes under the union territory so this time and the because the time limitation is there so we will be talking about only these four newly elected state governments and the expectation of the common people and also the whether these newly elected uh, uh, government those who have promised so much in their manifestos are they going to implement or not definitely media conference with lal goel not only now after every 3 months we are going to review and we will bring to you how many promises they have kept or not so the viewers should know the manifesto should be implemented not only just by words but by in spirit thank you and now i am coming to my main topic and that is expectations from newly elected state governments and today we have a very very elite experts in the field and those who are uh, 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 those who are involved directly or indirectly in the election processes or those who knows the states very closely i would like to invite my first guest he is dr cv anand bose ies dr cv anand bose ies is one man expert commission on labor to prepare an action plan for the welfare and development of the workforce in the context of covid-19 he is also the principal advisor government of india heritage project 
He was former head of disaster management government of India and central draft relief commissioner government of India. He was the vice chancellor of National Museum University of Delhi. He has authored 40 books in English, Malayalam and Hindi, including novels, short stories and essays. Four of his books have become bestsellers. Four books on Vastu and architecture and one book on housing received prestigious The Sharja International Book Fair Award. Dr. Bose is a housing expert, innovator, writer, orator, and visionary. The path-breaking institution set up by him, such as Nimriti Kendra, Building Center, District Tourism Council, and Habitat Alliance have been replicated at the state, national, and global level. He was the head of the prestigious Supreme Court Committee on the Treasures of Sri Padnava Swami Temple. Dr. Bose addressed United Nations General Assembly and specialized sessions five times as on various international issues. Dr. Bose is a recipient of 31 national and international awards, including United Nations Global Best Practice Award. He also received prestigious Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship. Kerala government termed him Lord of Ideas. Former Prime Minister Mr. Manmohan Singh called him inspired civil servant, and our Honorable Prime Minister Mr. Modi called him Man of Ideas. Welcome, Dr. C. V. Anand Bose on our show. Dr. Bose, you are very much involved. No, I will not say directly, but indirectly with all the elections. Earlier directly, when you were the returning officer or the collector or the, even when you were involved in the, uh, when you were the principal secretary, cabinet secretary of the, or the chief secretary of the Kerala government, and now also because you are dealing with almost all the governments because as a one-man expert commission on labor. Now, you know these elections have taken place. Governments, uh, newly go formed government are going to uh, take the charge from tomorrow onwards. And they have promised many things in their election manifesto. But the question is what the common people are now expecting from them whether they expect the whole manifesto which they have given before the election to be implemented or they have some other expectation or whatsoever expectations. So expectations from newly elected state governments, Dr. C. V. Anand Bose, IES, please. Thank you, Mr. Goel. Close on heels of the declaration of result to the four state assemblies and to the union territory of Pondicherry. When we meet here, what comes to my mind is the opening scene of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. There's a three witches meet. The first question, when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? The answer is when the hurly burly is done, when the battle is lost and won. I think the only way to sum up this election is the battle is lost and won. The battle is lost only by one state government. All other governments which were incumbents, they have won it. In fact, the, this is a very balanced uh, election, I would say. Perhaps for the first time that the public have decided to give one more chance to the incumbents. Maybe the last chance if they don't play it well. What people expect is action, not an alibi for inaction from the incumbent governments, which have been given one more new lease of life. Of course, in Tamil Nadu, the result is different, not because of particularly of anti-incumbency, Tamil Nadu always thinks differently. And in a democratic election, these are all lessons for us to learn. It is said that people get the government they deserve. Alexander Popper said, forms of government let fools contest. That which is administered best is the best. There is also a saying, that government is the best, which governs the least. With all these axioms in mind, when we look at the election results, I would say what the people expect of these governments is a manifestation of their manifestos. How they are going to deliver they have promised so many things, but will they be able to deliver? And will they be able to deliver it on time? That is the question 
which is going to be asked by the people. And the answer from the ruler should not be like Hamlet, to be or not to be. People expect definite answer. They want proof to see that the governments are willing and the governments are able to deliver what they have promised in the manifestos. Now, if you take the states one by one in Assam, it is very essential that there was a continuity in the government there. This is because of strategic reasons. You know, the Northeast is very important for us, strategically and also from the point of view of India's internal security. You know, the insurgency has almost ended there. There is a semblance of peace and quiet in all the Northeastern states, particularly in Assam. And developmental activities have been taken up by the existing government. Therefore, it is only reasonable that the public decided that this government should continue. You know, it's a very, very sensitive state. I had the opportunity to be the chairman of the technology mission for Northeast, all the, all the Northeastern states. And also till recently, I was advisor to the government of Meghalaya. In that light, I would say that we should have an extremely progressive policy on the Northeast. Therefore, this continuity there in the governance is something which is very, very welcome. You know, there are problems which are staring at us from outside, across the border. The problem of the Bangladeshis, and of course, what is now given in their manifesto about the national registry, all these things are very important from the point of view of India's integrity, India's unity, and also our survival. Therefore, the continuity in the governance of the state is something which will go a long way in consolidating India's peace and harmony, which we have brought about in the Northeastern states. And when we come to Mamta Banerjee, in spite of all the political chicanery that she has been famous for or notorious for, in spite of the fact that the people have taught her a lesson by not electing her from Nandigram, still there's a positive message in that. Mamta represents, she is a symbol of women's liberation in Bengal. And that is something which has been endorsed by the public. But in Bengal, we have to see that she has learned from the experience. The government, the people have clipped her wings, not without any reason. She's given a chance to rule. She's given a chance to rule, not misrule. In fact, even a phrase has come in Hindi. Earlier we used to say about Dada Giri. Now it is Didi Giri. This is something which people don't want. And one more lesson which Bengal has taught us is that it is not a simple lesson. Two political parties have been totally wiped off from the Indian political scenario. Yes, the Communist Party, the exception of Kerala is there, I'll come to that. The Communist Party and the Congress Party have almost been wiped off from the, from the election scenario in West Bengal. Jokingly, people say, I do not want to comment on any individual, but it, since it makes a point, people say that the best leader of the Congress party, they say, is Rahul Gandhi. You know why? Rahul Gandhi is the only Gandhian in that clan. Because Mahatma Gandhi said, after the independence, Congress has to be dissolved. Jawaharlal Nehru was not able to do that. Indira Gandhi was not able to do, do that. Rajiv Gandhi was not able to do that. Sonia Gandhi was not able to do that. But alone, single-handedly, Rahul Ji has been able to implement Gandhiji's wish of dissolving the Congress. That is an election result which we see in Bengal. Now, the, the jokes apart, it's a fact that two political parties have been near totally wiped out from the Indian political scenario, which is not a small thing. It has wider implications. And now, when we come to Tamil Nadu, in fact, I have Rai Shagran here. Rai Shagran has a new, unique position. He is living in Karnataka. He, he is born in Kerala and he is specialized in Tamil Nadu, all rolled into one. So I leave it to him to comment about or analyze the election results in Tamil Nadu. But certainly we know the politics in Tamil Nadu is little different from the rest of the country and that is showing its manifestations there. Again, we will say in Tamil Nadu, there is going to be a Stalinist regime, literally. In Kerala also, people say there is a Stalinist regime. Because not only the, tra the tractors of the Kerala chief minister, but even in that marriage, 
they say it on the slide that he has taken on the style of Stalin, a little autocratic. I'm not criticizing him. This is only a passing remark. I will not take up the issue of Kerala right now because not because I do not have a view about it, but I belong to Kerala. I'm in a newly elected government. I think pr propriety demands that we congratulate that government. We wish them well. This is not a time to criticize that government, but certainly there are certain many critical elements which lie embedded in this victory which they have there. I would only suggest one thing, something which has happened. The first communist ministry, the first democratically elected communist ministry in India in the world has was in Kerala. In 1957, the veteran communist leader, EMS Nambudiri Pan, he led the party to a stunning victory. And we had a group of ministers which were perhaps the best among ministers anywhere in India. They were all very scholarly, very learned. They were committed to the people. And one or two things which that government did, in retrospect, I will compliment them in the field of decentralization of power and also in land reforms. The first communist ministry really had done great things, but still they were dismissed. Why? They were dismissed because there was a liberation struggle. Who created the liberation struggle? The entire society of Kerala became anti-communist overnight. There were demonstrations, protests, and the democratically elected government was dismissed. We thought this is because of people's liberation struggle. No, no. Now it is known, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who became America's ambassador to India later, in his book, The Dangerous Place, he said that it is CIA money which galvanized the political forces against the Marxist government and it led to that opening. So these are not, this kind of tremendous developments which are taking place in Kerala cannot be dismissed outright. I do not want to make any allegations or come to any, 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 any conjectures now, but there is a fact. In the Kerala election in 1957, which led to the dismissal of the communist government, foreign hands were there. What I mean by this, I'll explain if you give me a chance next time. Now, since you're not taking up Pondicherry right now, I'm not going into that. Now, what we expect of these governments, Mr. Goyal has rightly read out the manifesto, the main salient features of the manifesto. What people expect is an implementation of the manifesto. And for this manifesto to be implemented, I would say that there should be a system where people give the report cards for the ministers. Every month, people should be giving report cards on the ministers and there should be adequate shakeup based on that. Of course, we do not have a constitution does not speak about recall, but there should be the people's mandate the social audit which is done by the people, the concurrent monitoring which is done by the people on the implementation of the manifesto should be developed as a means of so, as democratic accountability by those in power. And secondly, Mr. Goyal, I would add to the manifestos of the older states, each and every pie that is spent by the government is, belongs to the people. Therefore, it should come in the public domain. The expenditure, public expenditure should come in the public domain. And people should have a right to ask why this money was spent. Because all the freebies which are being given, I'm not entirely against freebies, but if you take the money which is meant for the development for the future and give it on attractive freebies, then where is development? What kind of a lopsided thinking about development? Of course, the poverty has to be addressed. The common people's problems have to be done. But this is not by just giving freebies from the exchequer. I think there should be an accountability for this. And one or two things which I would point to the to those who have framed the manifestos, please address the fundamental fundamental needs of the people, food, shelter, and clothing. To an extent, it has been addressed. But people should also have financial security. Why not extend 5,000 rupees of overdraft to all the people, especially those who are below the poverty line? Why not declare the states as hunger-free? The state should take it upon itself to see that every citizen in that state is fed at least one meal a day should be given to him. And the basic needs are to be addressed, not just giving freebies. The fundamental issues are to be addressed and fundamental solutions are to be brought about. I will certainly give my opinions about the Kerala situation if I get a chance later. But with these words, I conclude because I would like to listen to the other panelists. Of course, on, on, the, on Tamil Nadu, we have Rai Shagarin and one set of people who are ignored by us are the Pravasis. 
See, it is the Prabhasis who account for the well-being of Kerala. Kerala has a money order economy. Mr. Jacob is here. Was the state fair to the Prabhasis? This has been seen. The Prabhasis are the bulwark of the economy and the well-being and the sustainability of the state. Therefore, not just lip service, concrete action has to be done to protect the interests of the Pravasi. I, I, I would listen to the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bose, for giving a very vivid uh, analysis of all the states, all the four states, and uh, what Dr. Bose has he started from Assam, and he says that is a very welcome uh, uh, result because he says the continuity uh, of the government is very much required, especially in the border areas, northeast area, because of the internal security. And he says that uh, this will definitely give more chance to develop though that state as well as the security of the country. And when he came to the Tamil Nadu, he says that Tamil Nadu, he would not like to give more comments. He, he left for Mr. Raj Shekran, our, another panelist. But he says that uh, Tamil Nadu's thinking is different and they always have a, a set of mind how to elect the uh, government. He says about West Bengal, he says that there was a phrase in Hindi called Dadagiri. Now it has come to Didigiri. He says that people now is not interested that there should be a Didigiri. But he says that one thing has shown in the West Bengal election, and that is the two national parties, left as well as Congress, have been wiped off from the senior of West Bengal. Yes, at one time they were ruling the West Bengal, and now they are nowhere in they are only one seat for their both uh, uh, combined left and Congress could hold. So this shows that the change is there, but only thing is whether Ms. Mamta Banerjee, according to Dr. Bose, will change her style of rule, style of functioning that we have to see once uh, the government will take charge and will show some uh, results after the taking the charge. And about the Kerala, he says that the Kerala has uh, again elected the LDF uh, with a good majority. But the only thing is whether they will be able to fulfill every uh, ambition of the expectation of the people or as well as fulfill the promises which they have given in the manifesto, which he says that manifesto, people expect that whatsoever you are mentioning in the manifesto, it should be fulfilled. But whether they, they will be able to fulfill or not, he also appealed to the manifesto writers that they should have addressed the basic need of a person, kapda, roti, makan, food, uh, the shelter, and the clothes. So he says they had not have been addressed. He says, why not the uh, extra loan of 5,000 crore, 5,000 5, rupees per head uh, overdraft to be extended to the senior citizens who are below the poverty line? So he says the expectations, expectations are mount, many more. He also mentioned about the Pravasi. He says the Pravasis are the bulwarker of the Kerala state at least. And he says whether they are going to fulfill all the expectations of Pravasis or not, that is to be seen. Thank you very much, Dr. C. V. Anand Bose, for giving your opening remarks and analysis of all the four states where the new, newly elected state governments are going to take charge from tomorrow onwards. Now, I would like to invite my next guest, and he is Mr. Neoli P. Rajashekharan. Mr. Rajashekharan is a writer, music composer, and CEO of Guru Management Consultants Bangalore. His creative and social activities include publishing six Malayalam novels and over 40 short stories. He published two English novels, King Pound, based on Syrian civil war, and Ajadi, based on the conflict in Kashmir. He has published Competency Web, the Corporate DNA, and several other papers. He composed over 200 songs for labels and independent music, currently promoting three YouTube channels. He is coaching and mentoring startups. He is having experience of 45 years of international director level. He worked in for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. For 15 years in financial services, Bank of India, Chase Manhattan, and Standard Chartered Bank. 10 years in oil and gas, Shell, ExxonMobil, Qatar Petroleum, and 10 years in non-profits, CGIAR, World Bank-funded international system. 10 years in 
consultancy and teaching MBA students, entrepreneurs and corporates. He lived and worked in over 45 countries across continents. He is a management consultant, coach, speaker, creative writer, musician, and active on social media. He is a strategist on governance, performance, management, leadership, development, and HR. His expertise in management of startup, downsizing, high growth, turnaround, and cultural transformations. He is a member of Mensa International. Welcome, Mr. Raj Shekhan, on our show. Mr. Raj Shekhan, you have heard what Dr. C. V. Anand Bose, IES, has given in his opening remark. And he has mentioned about all the four states which he has analyzed. Now, we would like to know from you, expectations from newly elected state governments. Mr. Neoli P. Raj Shekhan, please. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Goel. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on your seminars as uh, they bring in different ways of looking at issues and make constructive suggestions. So I've always enjoyed being with you on these sessions. And thanks to Dr. Bose and also to Dr. Mr. Jacob, who are also on this panel. Uh, since the time is limited, I'll straight away jump into the subject. Uh, it's very interesting results that these elections have given us. As Dr. Bose uh, started mentioning it, I'll say three things which to me are very interesting in this. First thing is the establishment of electronic voting machines. There have been a lot of complaints, but now I don't think neither LDF nor TMC or any party will question the EVMs now. They have come to stay. And I'll, I'll expand on it later on because it needs to go further and reduce the cost of elections. So we'll come to that later on. And the second thing is that the parties that have been elected have been elected with comfortable margins. So they don't have to worry about their existence for five years as happens in coalition governments with, uh, with wafer thin margins. So they'll have no excuses because they have the power clearly given to them by the people. And so they can just get on with their delivery business. And uh, that's very important because a lot of governments have suffered from minor margins and you know trying to keep their constituents happy rather than worrying about what they need to do. So those two are really uh, very interesting points uh, in this election. And then I'll talk more about other trends as we go along. I'll start with uh, a, a, some general observations rather than going state by state. Then I'll obviously make a few remarks about specific states. Uh, there are short-term and long-term issues for all these governments. I think we need to start looking at it from that perspective. Now, COVID is obviously one of the biggest issues facing all these governments right now. And it has got both health and financial issues. Health from a perspective of vaccination, oxygen, beds, uh, supply and demand balancing, and also communicating better with people. And in many states, uh, people who have already won have not organized the campaigns very clearly or very well. There have been confusion about campaigns. So I think on a war footing, they have to deal with the whole issue of dealing with COVID and also immediate financial relief for segments uh, who need that. And these are two very short-term things that they need to address independent of everything else. The second, I would say, in the short term, is to start reviewing their own expenditures over the last five, five years. Dr. Bose um, sort of slantingly mentioned that, but I'll go a little more into detail. Because uh, when you get a second term, it's also a time for you to sit back and think, what did you do well? And what did not go so well? And what could you do differently? And it's time for them to do that. So one of the, I would say four things they need to look at very carefully. One is stop marketing at such huge costs. All these governments have spent tax money to, to promote themselves. And I don't know how much was spent. It's worth looking into that to see how much money has been spent on promoting themselves and their parties. Because the governments do get a good amount of free PR and air media time from different media. How much more should you spend on advertising? Let your, let your work speak for itself rather than promoting your own campaigns. Probably during the election year, it's a little more understandable. But now the next five years, why should you spend so much money promoting what you're doing at the expense of something else you should be doing? The second issue is there has been a, a multiplication of personal staff with each of these ministers and people who have been elected. They need to look at it. This is money being spent, uh, sometimes without any clear norms or guidelines. People are close to them. People are... Uh, their favorites are appointed. So how many personal staff does a minister need? 
And why can't they use existing ministerial or existing government employees for that? The third is to stop supporting sick public sector industries. This is very important because either close down or privatize. I know this is very sensitive. It's like showing a red rag to a bull. But it's time we started phasing it. Probably the governments were too concerned about their vote banks. But this is the time to do it because they have a clear mandate for five years. And I hope some of these governments will have the guts to do it because we are pouring a lot of money down the drain into non-performing uh, sick public sector enterprises. And also, as was mentioned earlier, government should get into governing, not managing buses and cafeterias and liquor shops. So get out of all this and you know let other people manage that. They'll create more employment and, and proper efficiency into these systems. So and the fourth one is stop placating government employees and groups. Government employees are the largest, largest number of uh, the employment group in India. And whatever happens, some of these governments have even in the last, from the very last days, have increased improved salaries, give a lot of money to people in, in government salaries, which, which doesn't make sense. Because at the end of the day, efficiency is also important in government. It's not only for the private sector. But that needs to be looked at. So those are the four areas where I think spending and waste had to be looked at. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, there needs to be transparency. These accounts have to be made public. How much was spent on advertising, how much on personal staff, how much on sick and public sector enterprises, and how much on placating government employees. And what's the rationale for this? The third point I would say is nepotism and support for own party and supporters. Once a government is elected, it has to work for the welfare of all people, not for their own party members. And this is extremely important. And, and using the party and the government mechanisms to build their own party and using backdoor entries, using their own power to build their own party will not go a long way in the long run. It may work in the short term. So people's expectation is that an elected government will look after their interests, independent of which party they belong to. And that also leads to victimization, that also leads to uh, restriction of media, uh, that leads to a lot of things when people are with us or against us. And a good government does not do that in a democracy. And uh, we are a democracy, so let's face it. So those were some of the short-term immediate actions that uh, government could, all governments could look at, and including the center. I'm not saying just only the state, because we operate a peculiar kind of system in India where there's a lot of freedom for the states. And there's always a, there's a constant conflict in a federal structure. Federal structures create, they're, they're good at creating creative tension. So you have the central list, state list, and the concurrent list. And there's always a debate on uh, whether it belongs to me or to you. But the important point is that everyone can work to change the laws and the constitution or the systems, but as long as there is a law in place, we have to live with that. And you have to comply with that. Otherwise, there'll be more conflicts which can be avoided by sensible long-term thinking in the national interest. <clears throat> we all have to, these governments also have a difficult task of balancing the state interest with the national interest. So that also needs to be taken into account in formulation of policies and processes and procedures. Now I'll talk a minute about national interest because nationalists are from all parties and religions. When I say nationalist, people immediately say, oh, you're BJP or you're this or you're Modi. I'm not talking about politics here. Nationalists are from all parties and religions. They're Indians. National security is an important issue, not only for us, but many, many countries in the world are working hard on this. And we are no exception. States need to believe in and support that, no matter which party rules India. That is, that's irrelevant. If India fragments, there will be no center or states. Growth of regional parties is, is happening. I'll talk about that in the, in the Tamil Nadu context. This has become a trend because many, many, many states are developing regional parties and they're assuming a lot more power. But regional parties have a big role to play because they have, they have got their ears to the ground, they have the trust of the people, but that cannot be used to create a divide between themselves and other states or between themselves and the center. It's a very important lesson for us in the next five years where it's going to be critical. The third point in the long-term aspects is public debt. There has been tremendous increase in public debt to implement schemes and I'll come to the utilization uh, in the next point. It's not about taking personal credit. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Instead of taking public debt, uh, some states have been reluctant in implementing some of these schemes uh, because they get the credit for it. It's not about who gets credit in this. The point is that whatever is available to an Indian citizen should be made available to the people in that state. That's their job. That's why they have been elected. 
And if they don't do that, they're not doing a service to the people who elected them. And in public debt also, that limit borrowing if more and more central schemes could be used instead of creating their own schemes. So financial stability comes as the fourth one. Many states have borrowed heavily. They're, in the last five years, the debt has gone up tremendously. And with no, uh, I don't know what kind of planning happens there, but it's high time for them to think. Because with continuity, they're also accountable for what they created in the past. If a new government come in, they could have washed their hands off and say, now you handle it. They can't. They're totally accountable for the debt they have created, as well as how, how they're going to deal with it. Important issue. Industries infrastructure, very important. Uh, as Dr. Bose said, if all the money is spent into creating SOPs and benefits for people, it's down the drain because you're not recreating wealth, you're not recreating revenue. So rather than giving money away, easy support with risk capital, working capital, not subsidies. So we'll also have to redefine incentives and disincentives. Based on the impact on staff welfare, the resource use should be sort of, I think there should be a negotiation with the center. For example, there was a very interesting case recently in the utilization of vaccines. The COVID vaccines were most effectively used by the healthcare system in Kerala. That's because there can be wastage in vaccines. Once you open a bottle, there are about 10 shots in a bottle. And depending on the capability of the, of the nurse who's administering it, you can 10, sometimes even, you can even get 11 shots out of it. If there is no wastage. But a state that does it so well should get more vaccines or should get more support. So you need to start incentivizing behaviors, incentivizing actions which are in the interest of the people. Now, the Kerala Election Manifesto, as you said, has talked about rapid reskilling of unemployed youth, creation of a knowledge-based world, etc. That's Those are long-term investments which Kerala needs very badly. And modernized transport and infrastructure, Kerala roads, there's a lot to do there. And then industrial corridors and high-speed rail connectivity are some of the other things in the infrastructure they've offered. But the, the more SOPs you give away, the more money you throw into uh, non-performing government organizations, they will not be able to do this because these are big investments that are required and jointly with the center. And it's also time to play ball with the center rather than being antagonistic about it. Next five years, smart states would make use of the center, make, start making use of every resource and every benefit and every, every possibility that the center can provide for the benefit of their own people. And then free housing, as I said, social welfare needs to be balanced with more central support used there so that their own resources can be put more into infrastructure and also revenue generation. Then curtailing freedom of the fourth estate. Some states have anticipated almost, created almost rules to, to restrict the press. They're creating cyber armies, spreading false information. All these have been part of the game before the election. Time to stop all that because we can waste a lot of time doing this. And then there are two issues. Very quickly, I'll pass on them. Sustainability on water management, mining and forests big issues for the long term, food security and agriculture. Agriculture is a state subject. So procurement systems have not been working. It's one thing to say there is a minimum base price for rubber or paddy, but if the, if the collection system is not working well, a lot, of, a lot of the grains are wasted. And also investment into distribution, storage and post-harvest technologies. There's no point creating more grains if they're lost. And finally, energy sector, investment in solar, encouragement and incentivization to go solar for industries and also technologies that make use of solar. Now, uh, finally, I would say uh, two things. One, electronic voting and link. Now we have five years to think about this. This is the time to think about it. Linking it with Aadhaar and more and more I see the need or the possibility of the center or the states going directly to people on referendums, for example. In an electronic medium, that's possible. And it's less expensive. It's almost marginal cost. And no one questions the EVM now. So if we can strengthen that system with, uh, for example, biometrics, people can sit in their homes and vote with biometrics. There is no question of any fraud there. And finally, the right to recall. There must be progress sheets, progress cards. As you said, Dr. Goel, this is very important to have periodic reviews of what has happened, what's been delivered, what's not been delivered, and reporting the feedback. So that's a fairly large list. And also let me uh, be realistic here. No party, no government is going to deliver on all their election manifesto promises. So it's also a question of how to prioritize and how to get the most balanced 
implementation that will give the best benefit to the people they represent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Rashekran, for giving a very, very uh, detailed analysis of the newly elected state governments. And one point which uh, he has mentioned, which just I want to highlight, is about the election EVMs or the voting. What he says now, because earlier the opposition, especially the Congress party, our party, TMC, DMK, they all were objecting and they were saying there is a manipulation in the EVM machines. But this time, uh, there was not a single such type of complaints or such type of protest has come from these parties. So what Mr. Rajshikran says, now when the EVM has successfully doing it, now why not we modernize it further and see to it that the people are sitting at home and they can vote. Now, and uh, it can be done by the biometric or OTP whatsoever. My, my reservation is only one, Mr. Raj Shekran, which, uh, uh, because I have done uh, this uh, media conference uh, uh, with other people also, and they found that, but my reservation is this, that a person, if he's sitting at home and if he's voting through the, uh, through the net or uh, through the smartphone, the problem will come, uh, the states like Bihar, UP, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, where the, uh, the, those uh, Bahubalis or those who are having that uh, muscle power, they will corner the entire village. They will ask everyone to put the vote to a particular party, put their thumb, and then they will go. So here, at least if they are coming to the election booth, they have some liberty that once they are going inside, they can a vote to whomsoever they want to vote. But once if they are at home, where there is no uh, paramilitary or central forces or the state police force, one can very well manipulate. This election, this uh, proposal was moved when Mr. Sheshan was also there. But it was discarded because of this reason. They always feel that this thing can happen. And until unless we will have some proof, uh, uh, foolproof system, which I am sure our the tech the way the technology is improving, something will come when this idea of yours, which you are saying, yes, it has to be implemented when we are transferring crores and crores of rupees every day uh, on the tip of uh, just uh, pressing a button. Why not we can't vote? But the only difference here is that here somebody will come and sit on your head and ask you to vote to a certain person or forget about the outsider. Even the husband or, or the wife will start uh, 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 start uh, 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 imposing their views on the other and see to it that they will vote. So that is the only reservation. But thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raj Shekran, for giving uh, such a good uh, analysis about the state government. Definitely, I'm going to ask you the question next in the next round, where we will see how those state government, the particular state government, what are the expectations and how they are going to implement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raj Shekran. Now, I would like to invite my next guest, and he's Mr. Jacob M. Chenepetta. Mr. J Jacob is MBA CPA. He is MD and CEO of Jacob's International Educational Consultancy, LLC, Kuwait. Mr. Jacob graduated in Bachelor of Commerce and Finance from AGUI USA and MBA Masters in Finance from NIM Mumbai. He is patron of Kolam Jila Pravasi Samajam and Punulaur NRI Association. He is a proactive member of the non-resident Indian community in Kuwait. He is a visionary and a pioneer in the field of education, finance, auditing, and consulting in Kuwait. He took up the task of spreading awareness of literacy and provided the necessary infrastructure. In 1999, Mr. Jacob, along with other prominent Indian community leaders, in Kuwait founded a community school for providing free education to the fellow Indians residing in Kuwait. For his explanatory uh, social work, Mr. Jacob was awarded and recognized in India as well as in Kuwait. Welcome Mr. Jacob M. Chenepetta on our show. Mr. Jacob, you have heard what Dr. C. V. Anand Bose IES as well as what Mr. Neoli Raj Shekhan has spoken. And both have given their views about the newly elected state governments. And somewhat, what are the expectations the common people expect from them? Now, as Dr. C. V. Anand Bose mentioned about you, you are a very prominent Pravasi who is in uh, Kuwait and you are from Kerala. 
and you know the the maximum pravasis in middle east from kerala and the problems and the challenges the pravasis are facing and especially during now uh, the covid time for last two years or the for, for last one and a, one year and uh, say two months is tremendous now the state government now which has come repeated again in the kerala especially i'm talking of kerala right now uh, is from the ldf so we would like to know from you from the point of view of the pravasis expectations from newly elected state governments mr jacob m chenepetta please hello very good morning to you all the brain of idea the veteran administrator one man expert commission of india dr c v anand bos ias mr lal goyal is the host of this program mr rajesh shegaran the another guest and dear friends those who are watching this program across this world good morning to you all once again my sincere thanks to you all for giving me this opportunity this unique opportunity to speaking at this a uh, media conference on zoom platform regarding the pravasi issues it gives me immense pleasure to be in the midst of you this morning i am greatly privileged and honored to taking part of this uh, media conference in the midst of many uncertainties now first of all i congrat congratulate election commission of india conducting a election very peacefully mostly all the states Uh, conducting an election in democratic democratical way according to the laws of india i take this opportunity congratulate him and his missionary across five states also i take this opportunity to congratulate all designated five chief ministers especially mr pranarai vijayan he is a one man show he is iron of kerala vice sardar vallabhai patel was the iron of india iron man of india same way in kerala we have uh, mr pinarayi vijay and the iron man of kerala why i said this because of his mandate uh, visionary only this government came to power second consecutive term in kerala Be not because mr goyal said because there are lot of uh, election manifestos promises and all there but all the parties are the same but pinarayi vijay's one man show was the election uh, mandate i feel this is my opinion also in all other states we can see that the assembly elections or everybody worked tirelessly for continue continuing their second consecutives but not happened in all the states for for everybody it didn't happen as a pravasi i am not going to all this uh, technicality but i am as a pravasi i wish to i wish to uh, say the good luck for everybody once again and second term and also for the stunning victory for the all the uh, political parties in the many states no room for pravasis to discuss any matters in uh, kerala as you said there was a majority people in kerala the young youngsters are living in ab living abroad in mainly in the gulf regions for their issues to be discussed their matters to be addressed where there was no platform Mr Pinrai Vijayan has introduced a Lok Kerala Sabha in uh, in Kerala to introduce a platform with the support of the one man expert commission Mr Mr CB Anand Bos proposed many proposals to Kerala government as well as the central government uh, to we need to have a platform to address the issues so accordingly the finally the in the term of the Mr Pinrai Vijayan's time the introduction a platform to discuss our matters i am one of the member of the Lok Kerala Sabha in Kerala i have got an opportunity to uh, discuss various matters in that platform now now i need to uh, put forward as as far as i am pravasi a uh, few things to the new governments in kerala mainly the immediate action to be taken for the stranded uh, pravasis in uh, kerala tamil nadu uh, bangalore i mean karnataka goa and bombay and many states of india there are many hundreds of pravasis stranded they cannot they are unable to go back go back to uae or kuwait or any other gulf countries because of the covid you know that's a covid but there is a precautions we can the vaccination precautions are there 
and there are many uh, immediate immediate addressing points like uh, the family standard in gulf countries uh, people, some family part of families are standard in kerala they wanted to join together some uh, importance should be given for the priorities should be given for this kind of people those who have lost their jobs going to be finish their uh, uh, visas and residencies so these issues the government state governments newly forming state governments must take initiative and address to the government of india and take a bilateral discussion with the each governments and make an a, a priority basis uh, uh, arrangements to enter in this countries and lift the ban of the pravasi uh, traveling this is a very important point i need to address this uh, media conference and uh, second things have an, another uh, point is that there are many fmgs foreign medical graduates are in india approximately 25000 i i understand they are here in uh, in india the government of india or the, by the support of the government of uh, government of uh, state governments this uh, this fmgs has to be uh, take their uh, services to be utilized for the covid time the pandemic time their uh, their services to be utilized for india's betterment this is what uh, i need to ask the government of india especially for sivi ananda boss since he is here he can put forward this matter to the government of india as well the mci this only one technical issue mci license not been issued for them to practice in india but they can use their according to their uh, qualification as a doctors junior doctors we can use them for the uh, servicing this sector medical sector to er eradicate the troubles or the problems or facing the health sector right now their services are valuable for uh, the indian nation now i i ask the government of india plus the state governments please take this matter as a very uh, serious concern and there are many in in expatriates as processes facing a many problems from 1970s from 1970 is the migration started uh, from kerala to other uh, uh, states of uh, gulf countries and other european and american states but the, when the pravasi start the migration since then there is a uh, problems there is a uh, memorandums there is issues but few governments addressed few of them but few are not addressed at very serious matters to be addressed also first of all i am talking about the voting rights voting rights the is has been given by the approval but the problem is still pravasi constituencies our representatives are not in the state governments not in the central government this is very our members should be in the parliament our members should be in the assemblies this is very important thing we have discussed this matter before also with the uh, one man expert commission dr sri anand bos put forward this uh, uh, matter to the government of india we need to have a pravasi constituencies everywhere in the uh, gulf regions this is uh, another uh, my point to be discussed right now in the politically i am not going to discuss anything right now at the moment i am not in a member of any political party i was in a 40 years i worked for the uh, national party in india but at the moment i am not in any political party so i am not uh, debating any political issues now uh, we have a pravasi i am the member of the pravasi i am put forwarding some points to address by the government of india and the state governments newly newly elected government should take this uh, points very uh, seriously this is what i wanted to uh, uh, explain in this during this uh, conference it is the duty of the nation or states to support the expatriates because they are the backbone of the finance of the nation and second thing the national society uh, social security board should be established and the free trade zones should be established in the in the states especially in kerala because we, we know that in the uae we have a free trade zones for each states each emirates have a free trade zone uh, so are the accommodating the pravasis return returnees of the pravasis and the still the pravasis those who are there financially capable people intellectual people experienced people in the various level their contribution we need to uh attracted so therefore we need to have an a free trade zones for expatriates in this in especially in kerala and the mainly the southern states the major expatriates are living from there those states so this is another point i need to tell that these free trade zones can avoid the or bureaucracy troubles for the expatriates we know the last uh, uh, last few years we seen that many suicides happen for the pravasis in kerala in kannur i understand that one sergeant started his business 
but the government and the, the government missionaries didn't work properly and finally he suicide and invested a lot of money in a, in a project but finally he didn't get the proper approvals from the due to the ignorance of the bureaucracy therefore we should have an a zone uh, for the issue and discuss this matters separate zone for this for pravasi zone it has to be trade zone it has to be established this is what i am appealing to the state governments now you will going to be take sharing uh, these days and there are many and, and full cooperation from the government should be uh, asked right now for this process betterment because this they are not asking this a free free of cost they are providing the foreign exchange to the india forex the backbone of the india how many crores of rupees they are bringing every year but now at the moment there are there are problems but still they are pumping the money to india to make india financially well and especially kerala state this all the things to be taken care while coming the a uh, new governments this is what uh, i would i would like to uh, request the governments and we have many things to be addressed even we addressed before also the same thing i don't want to repeat again and again in the conferences so i am saying the main two three things three four items have uh, asked the governments to take care as early as possible and also i asked the another states should is established like a loka kerala sabha a system in all other states like tamil nadu and uh, karnataka and bombay and many other states it would be better for addressing the problem a uh, matters bharatiya pravasi bharatiya divas we have but within one or two days we won't be able to discuss all the issues in that uh, uh, in meeting but we we have the, we have we should have a platform for all the representatives from across the world to address the problems of the pravasis that would be better especially i'm talking about the uh, un citizens not citizen of american citizen of indians or the european citizen of indians i am not talking about them i am talking about the pravasis pravasis those who don't have any other uh, residence in other countries those who have to come back finally to our own country and settle down here we are not planning to migrate we are not planning to leave india we are indians we need to come back to india and stay here this is our ultimate aim we are making we are doing our hard earned money should be invested in proper way in kerala proper way in other states so friendly investment friendly state should be come up in india that would be better like uh, china the china is, um, i am in it, it is came to my mind now it is the corona virus started in china now where is Ch corona virus in india there, uh, sorry in china there is no corona virus the corona virus spread to india all other countries we couldn't control them this is the like china we should have uh, some mechanism to adopt to uh, prevent all those countries like uh, pandemic like uh, all the issues and there are many things to be added with the sivyanand was explained so many things but I, he is my guru i am not going to overtake his uh, uh, or talking but i need to add something more to him as, as i am not a member of any political party right now i wanted to say that the gandhi ji's vision was dissolve the congress not at that time nehru couldn't do it that but now slowly slowly his uh, family members are doing that one Indira Gandhi dissolved the Congress in Tamil Nadu state with the, with the rift with the Kamraj, and and subsequently his his daughter-in-law Sonia Gandhi dissolved the Congress in West Bengal, dissolved the Congress in uh, Maharashtra with the rift with the Mamda Banerjee and the Sharad Pawar. Now finally the southern state was a stronghold over the Congress party has been collapsed by the help of the Rahul Gandhi. This is what happening nowadays in India. Slowly, slowly, Mr. Boss. collapsing and dissolving the congress party in india and wiping out very fast that's what we believe and that is the result of this elections now we can see anyway i'm not prolonging my talk right now in any question any question is there from mr lal goel i will address it again let me conclude with all this points i hope this all uh, this media conference will take uh, all this matter to the governments and the particular authorities i hope that uh, uh, competent authorities can take this all matters to uh, solve this i hope that especially our uh, pravasi constituencies is a very important matter and the fmg is very important matter and and uh, and, and stranded expatriates need to go back to their country and earn their food so as the i am asking the government again state government india government make the bilateral uh, dialogue with the uh, counterparts of these countries and make all the arrangements please this is my uh, request for all the government newly uh, newly sharing governments and the
this is thank you for in this uh, opportunity given to me to discuss this matter thank you very much mr goyal once again and thank also thank you for all the uh, panelists in this uh, conference thank thank, thank you, you thank you thank you very much uh, mr jacob for giving such a forceful expectations uh, from the pravasis this is the agon because he is in agony it's he not he the pravasis are facing trouble now the same pravasis who used to pump crores and crores of rupees or dollars in india they are facing problem because of the covid and their expectations from the state governments or the central governments are that when they have taken care of the finances of the of the state government or the central government now it is the time to give them something although they says that we don't want anything free we are ready to invest the money in india but we want some facilities and the first point which he has made it that there are lots of pravasis who are stuck up either in india or in the other country they should be giving some uh, passages after discussing mutually with the those governments or, or, along with the state governments or the central government secondly he says many health workers are in the country right now and because they cannot practice here as per the uh, law in their mci restrictions but some thing can be worked out so they can work for the betterment of the medical system right now and they can do that thirdly he says about the voting rights he says the pravasi constituencies are require very much required virtual constituencies which dr c v anand bose has proposed earlier uh, so it is in pipeline but he says we require so that our voices can be heard in the parliament properly and that's why he is he is in, insisting for the uh, those uh, constituencies and one more point which he has mentioned is that because many of the pravasis who have come back to india because unlike the us citizens uh, indians uh, nris or those who become the us citizen or in the uk or europe in in middle east all these pravasis have to come back to india uh, at, at given time one or the other time and that's why they want to start and invest money in india but they want a proper care for them no bureaucratic bureaucratic Uh, uh, red tape is, and he has given example of one of the industrialists or pravasi who invested money, but he could, he was so much fed up with the red tape is of the bureaucracy that he has to commit suicide. So he says there should be a pravasi trade zones in all the states where the pravasis are there, where the it should be a single window clearance or what so the assistance the government can give so that uh, they will not face any problem. And uh, he says the expectations are so many. we are ready to invest the money in india according to uh, uh, mr jacob and he says that uh, uh, the, the cm of the kerala who has been reelected again is a nice person according to him he compared him with sardar patel that how uh, the the cm of the mr vijayan is like a law purush uh, of india or the kerala thank you very much uh, mr uh, jacob for giving your uh, views now i would like to ask uh, dr bose dr bose as you have also mentioned that we would also like to hear your views on the election results in kerala particularly for the reason of the landslide victory of the role ldf ruling ldf once again because from the very beginning the traditionally it is once you ldf once udf but this is the first time that ldf has been re-elected and with a very good mandate what was the reason uh, dr bose can you just highlight that see uh, ms goel the, the mandate of the people has been very clear there is a decisive mandate in favor of the ruling party so whatever is the reason behind it democratic proprietor demands that we accept the mandate we compliment the chief minister we wish him the very best but one or two things which i would like to mention here all these governments which have been elected particularly the marxist led ld of government in kerala should realize that they are functioning within the constitution of india no government is above the constitution of india they get their mandate to rule that state because we the people of india who gave this constitution to ourselves have given them the mandate they take oath by the constitution the constitution envisages a federal democracy here 
there is no scope for a state government to fight with the central government. The political party can. The Marxist party can question the BJP, which is ruling the central government. But a state, once the chief minister becomes the chief minister, he ceases to be chief minister of a particular party. He is our chief minister. We have, may have different political opinions, but he represents every citizen of the state, even those citizens who are against him politically. This is a fact which all chief ministers have to bear in mind. You know, their duty is to get over the people of their states, whatever is there given by the central government as well. If you feel the central government schemes will endear the people to the, the government in power and center, and if you try to mislead the public, that is a crime against the voters. There is no scope for such confrontational attitude between the state government and the central government. You can negotiate. You can get the people of Kerala, whatever is there in the, in the schemes and projects of the government of India. But blocking it, and also the favorite, Mr. Rajshir also said, through advertisement, you are trying to take credit for things which you are not entitled. Okay, if you take the credit for certain things, well and good. But then don't block the facilities which are offered by the government of India to the people of the state, just because of myopic political reasons. This has to go, and the government of India has to come down heavily upon this trend, whoever is the chief minister. And number two, the attitude of the chief minister is very important. Nobody can dictate terms to a chief minister as to how he should change his style. I remember in the light of being, when I happened to meet him a few years back on an on a informal chat, I said in Delhi, people are all happy about him. He said, why? I said, because you are strong. We want the chief minister to be strong. The chief minister is strong. But that strength should be used for the benefit of the people. As Shakespeare said again, it is good to have a giant strength, but it is foolish to use it as a giant. This is not my view alone. Lenin, Lenin in his testament has written very clearly about Stalin. He said, comparing Stalin and Trotsky, the two leaders there, Lenin said, Stalin is arrogant. Stalin does not have any regard for the feelings of others. Stalin snubs people. And Lenin said, we do not want such a person there. I'm not comparing anybody, but if anybody has such tendencies, Please see that you are the servant of the people. You are not the master of the You may be master of your party, but you are the servant of the people. Any, 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 any political leader, however strong he thinks he is, he has to submit himself to the will of the people because it is the will of the people which has put him in that chair. This applies not only to the chief minister of one state, chief ministers of all states. If you have political differences, I tell you, do it by all means. Do it by all means. But the state government has no reason, no justification for a confrontationist attitude with the center. You can negotiate. The government functions with, you know, there is this instance of Jetli. Jetli was defeated by Amarinder Singh, Captain Amarinder Singh. Captain Amarinder Singh on record. He said, we are political rivals. But when as chief minister, when I go and meet Jetli as a finance minister, he said the relationship is different. It has to be different. This confrontationist attitude which destroys the, the well-being of the state has to go. There should be conciliatory approach. And it is a duty of the state government to see that every penny from, given by the central government is taken and given to the people here. Now, again, Mr. Rajasekhar said, issuing all kinds of, you know, schemes are okay. Where does the money come from? I don't want to take more time. For the benefit of all the viewers, you all know, there are only certain ways through which central funds can come to the any state. By fighting political fight, you cannot. Main thing is the Finance Commission. The Finance Commission makes a rec a recommendations on how to devolve finances between the center and the state. Once a decision is there, even if a particular state government writes letters or criticizes, they cannot do it. Their mandate is not above the mandate of the nation. Now, there are other ways the central budget, which has got centrally sponsored schemes. Why Kerala is not getting it? As a person who has spent 45 years in public administration, I say, Kerala is not getting it because Kerala is not fulfilling its share. 
if it's a 50% centrally sponsored scheme, money will be released only if the state government also provides 50%. Without doing that, don't mislead the people. Then there are special central assistance. Yes, there are special central assistance. This government, this government in Kerala, I'm speaking only of Kerala because your question is on my view about Kerala. How came that those who swear by the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, the money which is given by the government of India has not been utilized. This money which belonged to the scheduled caste and tribes have not been brought and given to them. And now when they say 10,000 crores, 20,000 crores, where does the money come from? In a lighter vein, Mr. Goyal, and with this I'll conclude. There was one general old man, Sangaran Nair. Sangaran Nair is in his deathbed. He calls the lawyer. He is dictating his test bill and testament of Sangaran Nair. Thousand acres of tea estate in Munar to my first son, Raman Guti. Three, three, 30 buses and one Benz and one BMW to my second son, Madhavan Guti. Then, 10,000 acres of paddy field in Kutanar to my daughter, Amri Kut. Then he kept quiet. Everybody thought something has happened. They said, why, why? Why this silence? He is saying, in a few days left for me, I was thinking, how will I acquire all this wealth? This is a state of affairs in Kerala. The treasury is empty. The treasury is empty. And now they, when they say, this is nothing better than Shankar Naya's will. Be realistic, be truthful. People should know. That is why I said, you know, there should be a record, progress report to be given by the people. And the source of funds, the expenditure as well, should be there in the public domain so that people can make them accountable. Empty vessels make loud noise. Please stop making loud noise. Ask, come down and do, the, do your work. People expect you to act. We want action, not an alibi for inaction. This applies to all democratic governments, not only to the government of Kerala. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bose, for giving your very, very forceful answer to my simple question. But anyway, because of the paucity of time, I would now go back, go to our next uh, panelist, and he's uh, uh, Mr. Raj Shekran. Mr. Raj Shekran, time is short, so one minute answer. You were mentioning about the how the Kerala has very nicely administered the vaccine. But the figure says something else. Initially, yes, COVID was it started from Kerala, then they controlled, then again it flared up in Kerala, very, this thing. They again controlled before the elections. How? That, that is a matter of question because all the five states or the four states and that, this thing, that COVID was not there. It has become a WhatsApp joke that the COVID is afraid to go to an election is bound state. But now today the condition is Kerala is in a very bad shape in spite of the vaccination. 26,000 cases are there in Kerala and all the all other places like West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, cases started increasing drastically after the election. And you are saying, so what do you say about this? If the, if the management was so good in Kerala, why the surge in between? Again, before the election, it has come down. Now again, it is going up like anything. What do you say about this, Mr. Ashekran? One minute, please. Please unmute, please unmute. I think uh, you misunderstood my point because what I said was the actual utilization of the vaccine that was made available. It's not about the spread of COVID. Spread of COVID was not managed very well. There's no issue about that, uh, including religious festivals, including uh, uh, political rallies, you name it. We, uh, and that's not only Kerala. I think all over India, there has been a relaxed atmosphere after the first wave came down. And that has led to the second wave. So that is that is very clear. So I was not talking about the way the spread of COVID was managed. I was talking about the way the vaccine, available vaccine was efficiently managed without wastage. Oh, okay. So those are okay. two different things. Okay. You know, it's okay. very clear. Thank Do you want me to take a couple of minutes on the states? You have the time or no? No, 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 okay. no, no. no. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm coming to Mr. Jacob, one minute only. Uh, you are the first person, I must say, who has complimented the Election Commission of India. Otherwise, including the Madras High Court, has fired them like anything. Apart from political parties, all political parties are also firing the election commission, and the public is also firing. Everyone is 
blaming the election commission what is the reason why as a pravasi you think the election commission has done a good job mr jacob please the large democratic country like india conducting an election fairly and peacefully is very difficult task it has to be that's the reason i said that difficult task controlled by the election commissions and its, and its ministry very well uh, comparatively past elections there were a very kind of violence happening i am not talking about the west bengal some all other states west bengal there was there were some uh, incidents but all other states was peacefully conducted the election and there was no much fraud is been reported at uh, all those things you know because on based on that i i complimented uh, election commission of india we need to give some support you know the the missionaries when they do something good we should appreciate them uh, okay. don't criticize always uh, that's the reason <laughs> okay thank thank you very much okay. mr jacob so today you have Mr. today you have seen the expectations are too high and why the expectations are too high because they were shown the hopes by the political parties and especially those now because we are not talking of the other parties those who have lost they have lost we are only talking about the political parties who are now going to rule those newly elected uh, the states where they have been newly elected and they are manifestos have shown so many things like uh, reducing the petrol liam prices drastically 3 or 4 rupees per liter 100 rupees on an lpg gas and the 3 rupees per liter of milk as well as many other promises which they have done as dr rcv anand bose has said from there they will get the money so this is also a question so expectations are high mr um, uh, rash shekran has analyzed in a very very uh, clear way that the whatsoever the they are doing they should work in the federal system they must give respect without any confrontation attitude they must uh, work in line with the center government and mr jacob has given uh, all the demands what the pravasis are expecting from these newly elected uh, states so today's program which has been live telecasted by the Uh, V4 News Global TV, V4 Stream, News Gaon se Samvad Saroka News as well as shown live on Facebook and YouTube. And our endeavor is to enlighten you with the current topic every day. And tomorrow our topic is COVID returns impact on criminal cases in India. And we have three young but very dashing advocates: Advocate Sidhanshu Khandelwal, Advocate Shivang Bhargav, and Advocate Srijan Mishra. They will be there tomorrow to discuss the COVID returns impact on. criminal cases in india thank you very much dr c v anand bose thank you very much uh, mr rash shekhran and thank you very much mr jacob charapeta for joining and giving such a uh, i must say and uh, you have enlightened the public all the voters of those states that watch they should they are expecting that how the go- state government are going to fulfill so that thing which people are not understanding that the manifesto when they are putting it they should also fulfill all those things which they are putting in manifesto they should not be a man it's a it's, it's a manifesto it's, it's not should be a just to fool the public or the voters at large thank you very much and thank you all the viewers for watching our show and enlightened by this today's program thank you very much